Hey everybody, welcome back to Diesel Creek. My name is Matt. Behind me, my big red building there, is my dream shop. Now, if you haven't been following this project since the very beginning, there's a whole playlist linked down in the description. But basically, we took this place from a raw piece of land to what you see behind me over the course of the past year and a half. As we neared completion of the building, updates have become few and far between from my end because there really hasn't been a whole lot of progress to justify a whole video. So in this video, let's get you caught up with what's happened over the summertime with the build and uh, what we have left to do in the future. Let's check this one out, guys. It is move-in day for me at the shop here, but at the same time, I've got a guy out here drilling me a well finally so that we can have some drinkable water out here at the shop. And fitting with the whole theme around here, this is an old drill rig. That's a, oh, I believe that's an S1900. Or what is that? Yeah, I want to say it's an S1900 international truck, but uh, that's not really the focus. I believe this is a Bucyrus Erie drilling rig on the back here. And this is a, what you call a poundered rig, a hammer rig, I think you call it, um, versus... Uh, a rotary style drill rig, which is more common today. I think this drills a little bit slower, but uh, I've heard arguments that it is a better type of well because what happens here, and they didn't start drilling yet, everything's just set up and ready to start here first thing. But basically this big drill stem just has a big hammer slug on the end of it. And all the way to that drill stem, all the way up there, I don't know, what is that, 25 feet or so? Maybe 30. Pretty long. But anyway, it's connected to that cable up and over the sheave down here. And as the drill rig runs, this arm right here is just going up and down the whole time. And it pulls on the cable that's running under it right there. And that just lifts the hammer up and down and it just pounds away. And over time, as it's pounding, there's also a winch line down there on the drum and they'll just slowly let that winch line out and that'll feed that hammer down into the ground further and it just keeps pounding back and forth that whole time as it gets lowered down into the hole. But anyways, the difference between that and the rotary is of course the rotary spins around and drills more like a modern drill bit. But supposedly the rotary has a tendency to kind of seal up the ground as it goes down, whereas the pounded supposedly does not um it's, i don't know that there's much science behind that but it's kind of hearsay you hear from different people i just thought it was a cool drill rig and hopefully in the next day or two we've got us a nice water well down here my man just showed up and fired this baby up and went straight to pounding Pretty wild. this morning and
Well, she's probably gonna take two full quarts of 40 weight oil to make her to the Texaco station, but outside of that, she's cherry. And we got us a well. She is drilled. I have not connected it and pumped it out yet, but uh, it's in there. All right, it's time for our lighting above the garage doors for that. I went to this Steel Lighting Co. Um, these guys are an American company, and supposedly all this stuff is American made, so really looking forward to getting some of this stuff installed. There's definitely a lot of Chinese competitors out there, and I really didn't want to go with cheap junk. You know, you buy cheap light fixtures and stick them out in the elements, and before long, they're all corroded and nasty looking. But I got these nice old, uh, they call them barn lights, but I, I think of them as like uh, stuff you'd see back in like the 50s and 60s at service stations. Those old school, Yeah, these things. Look at that. That's gonna look nice. All right, so to assemble these lights, it's super easy. Just pass the wire through the globe here. It sits down and engages like so. Then from the other side, you take your nut with your sealing o-ring on there pass it through now this nut is reverse threaded so you have to spin it opposite what you normally would as i just demonstrated it doesn't go the wrong way make sure as you tighten this up that your o-ring stays seated down in the groove on the nut uh, honestly, you can probably get away with just snugging these by hand, but I am snugging them up a little bit more with a, a wrench here. Take our wires again, pass them through the gooseneck. Now this gooseneck will just thread straight down into the top of the fixture here. And that's why the other nut is reverse threaded is because now you have to run this thing standard thread. And if it was not reverse threaded, you would end up loosening that nut off trying to tighten up the gooseneck. Last, your base plate. Wires just pass right through it, just like everything else. It threads onto your gooseneck. And lastly, there's a set screw that goes down into the set screw hole on the base plate. And that'll keep that thing from loosening up. The set screw is the smallest of the screws that come in the pack. And the reason for the set screw is because your box may not be aligned. You know, your box, if you just bolted it up wherever it tightened down at, your box may have your light on a goofy angle like that. So uh, the idea with a set screw is you fasten your, uh, you fasten your base plate to your box and then you get your light hanging how you want it and then you use the set screw to tighten it up. Keep it from getting out of whack on you. So there we go, that's an assembled light, ready to mount it on the wall now. Bob's getting the outdoor above the garage door lights hung. Already got one up, looking really good. I like these lights a lot, they look awesome. I didn't record any of it, but uh, 
was it two weeks ago now, I think, I took the weekend and I made the big leap. I brought everything from my old shop to the new shop here. So my garage at home is completely cleaned out and empty. Uh, this island of crap here in the middle of the floor is still things that I'm in the process of sifting and sorting through and relegating to different areas of the shop or out to the shipping container building. Those blue Connex boxes that we bought at the auction a while back with all the shelving and everything in those, um, I'm going to be eventually putting those to use back here in the new laydown yard that I cleared a few videos back. So once those containers are all in place and everything, I haven't figured out exactly where I'm going to put them yet, but once they're in place, anything that is not essential to work in this building is going to be out there. So I'm going to try to keep this uh, building completely clutter free if that's possible. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm, off, I'm off to a great start. There's no clutter in here at all. But anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm going to try to keep this a workspace only and not a storage building is what I'm really getting at. So wish me luck on that because I've never had luck in the past, but I've never had this kind of space either. So I'm hoping I can uh, pull it off. One of the big perks of having a shop here and a roof over our heads is that I can bring old Roscoe and friends with me a lot more often now. We actually are up to four dogs. You guys have never met the newest two. But uh, I've been bringing Roscoe, but I've been bringing Roscoe out with me so he can hang out here and uh, make sure I'm not slacking off. Over here for tool storage, I uh, picked up one of these Icon boxes from Harbor Freight, and uh, yeah, I'm, I I like the box. It's a great box. I'm not knocking the box one bit. You'd love to buy something that's uh, really built in America, like a Snap-on box or something else. But I tell you what, they're outrageously overpriced. For what you pay for these things, I really don't think there's that much of a quality difference. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's as good as Snap-on, but uh, it's definitely a lot better than one of those Husky boxes or something you're going to get from Lowe's. I still brought my old toolbox in here. I don't know. I'm going to be kind of swapping things in and out, trying to figure out tool storage. That's a whole headache unto itself. But uh, as you guys can see, I like stickers. So uh, if uh, you guys want to send some stickers, I know I've had people ask me before, there's a, a P.O. box down in the description there, so if you want to send some stickers over, they will get stuck places. These Stanley Vidmar roller cabinets here, these came out of those blue containers that we picked up at the auction uh, a few months back. So this is just two of them. I think I have seven out of that whole container spiel there, and I'm just trying to get things figured out in here. I've got some stuff slightly organized already. This drawer, I've got gloves and respirators and stuff like that. Down here, I've got abrasives, grinding wheels, PPE for welding, stuff like that. I'll probably do a complete shop tour one of these days once everything is uh, a little better organized. It's very preliminary stages right now, so I'm really not ready to do all that. All right, so we are trying to get a little bit more organized here with the tool storage situation. I'm trying to clean up some of the clutter and the mess a bit. So I picked up these Toolganizer uh, 3D printed wrench organizers. They got magnets in the back of them and whatnot here. And I'm hoping we can turn this mess into a little more organized here. I got screwdrivers organized a bit. I like these organizers. I just got to get some more of them for the Phillips. Same up here with the uh, straight screwdrivers. Just need to get a get a few more of those going. And uh, getting organized has really showed me how many tools I'm missing, actually. There's a lot of gaps I gotta fill in. Uh, so the same thing happened here with the wrenches. Wrench organizers work out really good. They don't hog up a lot of space like these traditional styles do. But I quickly found out that my box wouldn't allow me to put my jumbo wrenches up in the drawer I wanted, so I had to move those down here. And uh, I've got some gaps to fill in, of course, here. I try to acquire good brand wrenches at uh, flea markets and sales, you know, things like that. So these are just some repeat wrenches down here. But I've got to get the couple wrenches I'm missing to fill in the sap there. 
All right, guys, so the shop has been really coming along lately. I've been moving all my stuff in here, trying to get settled in. And today we got a very, very special delivery that I have been jonesing for for years. So I got my buddy Andy here from boltsandnuts.com, and he has just set me up with an awesome bolt organizer. So uh, let's go take a look at this thing. Yeah. So uh, Matt, Matt reached out to us. He said he needed a bolt kit for a shop down here. This is what we came up with. It's over 20,000 pieces. It was custom tailored to his needs. And there's a lot here. This entire kit is all grade eight hardware. We go from quarter inch to three quarter inch for his heavy machinery, and that's both coarse and fine thread. And then we also have 10.9 metric for our, your metric needs. And then we have all the nuts and washers to go with it. We actually share slots here. So you have both your lock nuts. These here are crimp, crimp top. And then you have your regular hex nuts. So they share slots. That way when you're looking for your nuts, they're easy to find. And what's really cool about all of our bolt kits is there's this little QR code. So when you run out of stock, all you have to do is scan that QR and it'll take you to that exact item on our website. And all of our kits come with this. We stock over 160 different fastener assortments. It makes reordering super simple. I'm really looking forward to it because that's the biggest hassle. Anytime I've dealt with having bolt bins, it works and you know, places I've worked in the past is there's, you're always out of stock because the last guy didn't tell the guy that they're out of stock and now they're going to wait for the guy to come in for a week or whatever it is. And this, you just scan it from your phone, it's going to be super, super simple. I'm, I'm really excited about that. Yeah. And then over here we have some of our grab and go kits, which is kind of cool about these. When you're working out in the field, all you, you can just take these and go. There's a little lock on here, but all of these are different types of fasteners and they all have the QR code for easy reordering. So each one of these kits is something different. And we have our drilling screws, machine screws, button sockets, and we have our set screws right there. And then we brought you a bunch of zip ties. These are heavy duty UV zip ties. You can never go wrong with zip ties. No. Let's see here. And then we also got you some Drill bits. These are some of Love our it. drill bits sets we sell. I didn't tell you about these. No, yet. you didn't even tell me about these. I'm really excited now. <laughs> so yeah, these are our drill bit sets. We sell these too, um, and this has a bunch of different sizes in there. Again, Please. kind of kind of like our assortments. You don't worry about that thing. I'll yeah. never put it back in anyway. <laughs> so this is a standard boltsandnuts.com setup. So you say you're third or fifth generation? I'm fifth generation fastener. Fifth generation fastener guy. That's, that's a guy that knows his nuts right yeah. there. So. Our family's pretty screwy, <laughs> as I say. There's so many great jokes to be made here. <laughs> yeah, but, we've, we've been doing this for a long time and uh, we were the generation to bring it to the internet. So that's why we use the QR codes and try to make things simple for you guys. At yeah, home. this is gonna be an absolute game changer. It's gonna save me from driving 20 minutes one way to the hardware store to grab a handful of bolts and then come back and find that I didn't get the right size. So this hey. is gonna be an absolutely uh, massive game changer. That's awesome. Well, that's good to hear, Matt. We're definitely excited, excited for this for you. So. So these sets from these guys are completely customizable. So you can just kind of order whatever you want, how big or how small they have setups that are way bigger than this. And they have ones that are way smaller. So you just kind of tell them what you're after and they can get you hooked up. In my case, I don't do a whole lot with metric. So I do have some metric, but not a whole lot, pretty limited selection. Just kind of your most common sizes. Uh, in SAE, I have quarter through three quarter in uh, coarse and fine thread. I got lock nuts, lock washers, all that business. I even got, uh, I use a lot of heavy washers. For all this equipment, sometimes you want a good, thick, heavy washer. So we got those. So yeah, these guys have been awesome to work with. And uh, again, big, big thanks to those guys. If you're interested in a setup for your facility, the link is down below and you can save yourself 10% if you use the code. I'm Roscoe. Yeah. I scrounged up this, uh, this bench out of the scrapyard a couple weeks back, and uh, it's a real heavy bench. Somebody told me that it was a printer's bench, which I could believe it makes sense. They would have all the uh, your printer dies or whatever in here, something like that. I don't know, but uh, it's a nice heavy bench and I only paid 40 bucks for it, so couldn't be happier with that. Got old Roscoe and Barrett, the electrician's dog. My buddy Bob up in the boom lift putting on the fish finishing touches here on the building getting a uh, floodlight big old floodlight 
mounted up here what will illuminate the whole back area of the building here eventually pretty excited to see this thing at night finally out here in the dark about to hit the floodlight and see what it really does Holy crap! <laughs> that is amazing. That is one light illuminating this entire area. And of course these cameras don't do low light conditions justice anyways. Even as far back as the tree line back there is pretty well illuminated. That is quite impressive. What do you think about that? Got this place lit up like the 4th of July out here. Kind of like staring at the sun, ain't it? These two lights under the overhang here are more than sufficient for what I will probably ever use them for, but I think with hindsight being 2020, I would have uh, put a third one in there and respaced them out just kind of looks it just kind of looks like it could use a third one I guess also got the wall packs kicking in over here on the side lots of light over there no worries if you got to drive a wide tight load around the building at nighttime or something and this is all just coming off of this building don't forget the shipping container building over here also has a bunch of floodlights on it and it really does quite a number lighting up this back area as well so yeah if we put both of those on it'd be better than having a light plant out here I'd venture so this is the parking lot light that we put up or the floodlight there in the peak of the building highly recommend this stuff this is the same brand that I used for my interior lights here and they've been working out great so far so this is a 300 watt and you guys saw how bright that thing was. It was pretty, pretty awesome that you can get that much light. And you can get that much illumination out of just one of these bad boys. So I have this extra light here and I'm still working out where I want to put it. But I think it's also going to go in the back to help illuminate the lay down yard at some point. So as we're coming into September of 2023 here, things I have left to do. A, get power into the building, which as you guys saw, I do have all the trench work and conduit laid out and tied into the building. We are this close to having real mainline grid power tied into the building here. So speaking of power going into the building, if you guys watched the videos of me trenching and putting in all the conduit for my electrical service here for the building, um, there was a common comment that kept popping up over and over and over again was that I should have gone with an off-grid solar setup. If I had a dollar for every comment that told me I should have gone that route, I could have just paid the power company. Um, what I think you guys are failing to take into consideration is A, I live in Pennsylvania, so we don't have any record-setting amounts of sunlight. Uh, we get pretty gloomy winters, maybe not a ton of snowfall, but just general doom and gloom for four months or so. Um, so there's that. The fact that I spend all day in this shop and then eventually I'm going to have a house also out here. So any kind of solar setup that I would put in would have to be expected to run not only the shop, but the house as well. And again, we're home all day, every day. So the demands are not like a typical household where you have like a good eight or ten hour span of no one home and then they're home for a few hours and then they go to bed so the system has all that extra time to catch up and uh, recharge you wouldn't have that in my scenario i'm down in a valley so i have a shorter duration of sunlight it gets dark down here about a half hour earlier than it does up on top of the hill and i can't even supplement with any wind because there's hardly a breeze down here as I say that, of course, there is a breeze, <laughs> but not much of one. Uh, you definitely couldn't keep a windmill turning down here very often. So I'm not saying that you couldn't do a solar setup. I'm saying that with the demands of the shop 
especially added with the demands of the house, I think that it's impractical. Not to mention that over the course of 20 years, or maybe less, uh, your solar system loses efficiency. All your, your panels that are up on the roof, they lose efficiency and they go bad. Um, and the same thing with the batteries. The batteries uh, get weaker over time. They don't hold a charge as long. They don't have the same energy yield that they do uh, when they're new. So in 10, 15, 20 years, you have to dump another substantial amount of money, 20, 30, 40 grand back into your system to get it uh, back up and working. So anyway, I did think about the solar. I would have loved to have gone solar. Uh, so many of you think that that's the way I should have gone. Uh, and I wish you were right, but it just won't, I just don't think it would work for me. So what else needs done before winter sneaks up on us here? Well, I need to ditch from right about there through here and out that way to where our wood boiler is going to go. And that is going to be how we heat the building primarily. That insulated PEX line will run clear over somewhere right in this area here. I'm going to build a small little pad and eventually a little shed, like an open air shed to store firewood under. But anyways, our boiler is gonna go over there and the boiler is gonna be how we heat both the shop behind me and the house that we're eventually gonna build over here. So over here under the lean-to on the corner of the building, I want to enclose in about a bay and a half here and make it kind of like an office slash tool room so over here under the lean-to of the building, I'd like to expand and enclose and insulate uh, about a bay and a half of this. It's 16 feet because the posts on the building are 8 feet on center. So it's like 16 feet um, of the lean-to here. I would like to get enclosed and incorporated into the building and then we'll turn this window into a doorway. I think I've mentioned that in previous videos, but that is still my plan. I just thought I'd get a lot further with it this summer, but it just wasn't in the cards. So we're going to keep working towards that goal. At some point that is going to get done. That's why I have this heat loop from the floor comes out over here uh, so I can basically tie into that and make the floor in this area heated as well. These are conduits that I have peeking out over here. We have an electrical conduit coming from the main panel in the building. And this conduit right here is gonna run out to the shipping container shop. We're gonna have a sub panel in here in this office expansion. And this here is airline. So we're gonna have the compressor actually tucked away, stored in the red Connex box. I have an auxiliary reservoir tank that we're gonna put in here in this office space. And that way uh, we can have on-demand high volume of air without the noise, which will be pretty darn nice. On the back side of the building here, basically we need to clean up all this junk. Uh, I have a bunch of lumber that I cut from the mill. It's all been sitting here just drying underneath the roof. I don't want to leave it outside and let it get rotten or start to get the termites into it or anything like that. So I've actually got an old trailer over here that I'm going to start cleaning out and try to make it into a lumber storage trailer for now. Uh, we'll throw all that nice lumber in there and let it be out of the weather. Eventually, I'd like to get the sawmill off this porch. I kind of just set it up here to play with it in the short term. Long term, I'd like to put it over there, kind of where that light plant and the roller is sitting. I want to make a lean-to down off of that building and build the sawmill its very own little space to live out of the weather. So, not only we do... So not only do we need to clean the porch off, we also need to continue filling out this area. Uh, as back in the springtime, I cleared out this area back here and I want to turn this into an equipment lay down yard. So we need to bring in a pretty significant amount of fill material back here where the roller is sitting and we'll fill that all up, make this a nice level area, maybe eventually get it graveled, but that's uh, probably not in the cards for a while. But the immediate area right here, about where the bulldozer's sitting, all the way up to the concrete, we need to get that all rocked in sooner than later so that I can actually use the back door of the shop here. Right now, I've never driven a single thing other than the forklift back and forth through the door. I've never driven anything into the shop from this side yet. So again, something I thought that I'd get a lot further with this summer and just haven't found the time. 
The problem is there's not a single direction I can turn out here and not see something that needs my attention. Even old Roscoe here demands a bit of attention, so I'm doing everything I can with all the time I've got. So that's all I got for now, guys. If you liked the video, do me a big favor, hit that thumbs up button down below the video. It doesn't cost you guys a dime, and it really helps out the channel. If you would like to help support the channel in a little more direct way, head on over to dieselcreek.com, pick yourself up some sweet swag over there. We've got hats, t-shirts, beer koozies, sticker packs, the whole nine yards. That's dieselcreek.com, link is in the description. I'm gonna go home and edit this thing up for you guys. So until the next time, thank you guys for watching. I'll catch you later.